Praise be Jesus Christ, and thank you for joining me for Lexio on the Go. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our scripture readings are taken from James 1, chapter, or chapter 1, verses 22 through 27, and the Gospel of John, chapter 16, verses 23 through 30. Um, this is, these are the readings for the fifth Sunday after Easter. I um, want to focus uh, pretty much exclusively here on the epistle from James. Uh, this is a pretty famous one. I think you've probably heard it. Uh, James says, be doers of the word and not hearers only. So be a doer of the word, not just a hearer of the word. Um, this is, of course, the Bible, the word of God. Um, and then he says a little bit later, three times actually, he talks about a religious person or what a religious person is or what true religion is. And he says that true religion it, uh, religion that is pure and undefiled is this, to care for the orphans and the widows. Um, you could say caring for the uh, most vulnerable in our society. And then being or keeping unstained from the world. And so kind of a twofold thing here, but obviously um, having a lot to do with doing or activity, not just um, a, a belief alone or a faith alone. So we do not believe in faith alone. We believe in faith and works. James is really adamant about this. And he talks about how some of those works, of course, need to be taking care of the most vulnerable, the orphan and the widow. Uh, we would say in our time, uh, for sure, the orphan and the widow, but also the unborn, for instance. And then the uns be unstained from the world. Um, one example of being unstained from the world or an example from Scripture of this, a uh, commentator said, you know, when, when Jesus was washing the feet of the apostles, Peter said, well, wash my whole body, not just my feet. And um, our Lord said, someone that is already clean doesn't need their whole body, but only their feet. And why is it that you would just wash the feet? Because the feet are what has what, the part of your body that has been in contact with the world. And so we are living in the world. We are secular people. As lay people, we are in the secular world. We have jobs in the world. We have uh, relationships in the world. So we are in and out of the world all the time. And so we have this contact with the world, but we need to keep ourselves uh, unstained from that world. We need to have our Lord wash our feet and, and uh, we need to be undefiled and unstained from the world. Remember, it is the world is one of the things that we reject in our baptism, that we reject uh, our threefold enemies, uh, the devil, the flesh, and the world. The devil, of course, is Satan, who wants our ruin, and his uh, demons, who want our ruin. The flesh is our own sinfulness and our inclination to sin. And then the world is really the false teachings of the world. And all in the world that loves um, man and loves vanity and stuff, material things rather than God. And there are a lot of those things. There's a lot of falsehood right now. Uh, there always has been. There's a lot of empty promises. Um, and there's a lot of vanity, especially putting man um, either equal or greater than God, which was that first temptation in the garden. And so there's a lot of work that has to be done there. There's a lot of doing, not just hearing, but doing that we need to do to be truly religious people and uh, truly practice our religion. And I want to st uh, stress the fact that James is talking about religion as a positive thing. There has been a lot of, especially within, I think, the last five uh, years to a decade, people that have said, well, I'm spiritual, but not religious. And so there have been a lot of people that have been hurt by organized religion. And so they, they just say, I don't want organized religion. And, um, and that's a big mistake. Um, religion is a good thing. You know, sometimes when people say, I don't want organized religion, I'll say, well, what do you want? Unorganized religion? Because that's really what it becomes. When we, when we do away with religion, um, we, you know, a formal religion or an organized religion, and we just start to kind of make up uh, everything on our own and say, I'm a spiritual person. What we have really done is created our own unorganized religion. We have become what we call Gnostic, that I get to call the own shots. Um, and so each person becomes their own kind of um, authority, their own bishop, their own pope their own um, interpreter, interpreter of, of scripture, their own magisterium. Uh, they get to decide the prayers. They get to decide the liturgy. They get to decide the interpretation. So therefore, they get to decide everything. And that is not what Jesus Christ founded. He founded an apostolic church. Uh, he gave the authority that was given to him to the apostles, and they passed that down 
faithfully. And we'll look at some of the elements of what religion is and how religion is organized and how that's actually a good thing. Although there are bad people and good people in religious organizations, that doesn't make the religion itself or order an organization a bad thing. Um, so um, I want to just uh, kind of give three examples here. But the first I want to point to the fact of what Paul says. And, and Romans 10 is one of my favorite um, verses in scripture because Paul just does a great job of outlining. So this is Romans 10, 14 and 15. Um, and Paul tells us, um, how are they to call upon him in whom they have not believed? But how are they to believe him whom they have not heard? And how are they to hear if no one preaches? And how are men to preach unless they've been sent? So again, Jesus sends these apostles. These apostles are the first bishops. They're, they're called to preach the gospel to all of creation. And so they have been sent by Jesus Christ. It's important that we know that Jesus Christ sent these people. Why? To preach. To preach the gospel. Jesus Christ. Um, and why do they preach? So that they can hear. And what are you supposed to do when you hear? You're supposed to believe and then call upon. And so if we go back to being not just hearers of the word, but doers, well, there's two items that would uh, kind of go in that doing. So it's obviously that Paul just said, hear it, but hear it for what reason? So that I can believe, have faith, and then call upon him. The primary way we call upon him initially is obviously through the sacraments of, of especially baptism. So if I come to hear about the about Jesus Christ and the gospel and I want to call upon him, call upon the name of the Lord, then I would be baptized. I would continue to call upon him, uh, of course, through prayer. I would continue to call upon him in the mass. I would continue to call upon him through spiritual reading. I would call upon him through the sacrament of uh, penance, confession, when I need to go. Call upon him in holy orders or matrimony if I'm called to those, called to that vocation. But we call upon the Lord through a life of the sacraments. And that is action. That takes work. Um, it takes work to go to confession. It takes work to go to mass. It takes work to spiritually read every day, the discipline necessary to pray and to fast. This is a work. This is a doing, not just a hearing. So, and this is truly how we call upon the name of the Lord. If, if you are in the vocation of marriage, then you probably need to call upon the Lord daily to be a good spouse and to be a good mother or father. If you are a priest or a bishop, you need to call upon the Lord daily for the graces necessary to practice the vocation you have been called to. If you struggle with sin, and who doesn't, um, if you commit serious sin or, or venial sin, hopefully just venial sin, then you need to call upon the Lord through confession for that repentance and that true contrition to go and sin no more. If you uh, are going to Mass, hopefully every week you're going to Mass, keeping holy the, the, the Sabbath, then you are calling upon the Lord in the Eucharist. And so this is action, action, action. Uh, one of the priests uh, uh, recently that I heard a homily, he said that it's, it's like cooking um, like a broth or a stew. Or in my case, I'm going to give you the example of pasta sauce that I make uh, weekly, and I have been for a long, long time. Um, that you have to have three things if you're going to make anything. Um, you would first have to have the ingredients. So if you were to look up a recipe online, you are going to find out that what the ingredients are. Every website is going to give you the ingredients. Another thing that they're going to give you is the, the heat source. Uh, how are you supposed to cook this? Are you supposed to put it in the oven, on the stovetop, in an electric smoker? What are you supposed to do? And so there's the ingredients, the, the heat source, and then of course, not, not in the heat source, you would also have the temperature. Um, so ingredients, heat source, and temperature, and then how long? What is the duration of time? Because you can have all the right ingredients, but if you don't apply the fire, if you don't apply the heat, nothing will happen. You'll just have a bunch of vegetables in a pot or something like that, or a meat that'll just sit there and go bad. So, and, and then the other thing is, if you have the right vegetables and then you apply the heat, then if you don't cook it for a long enough time, then it won't be good. It, all the stuff will not reduce down and break down to what it needs to do. When I, when I cook my pasta sauce, I put everything in a uh, Dutch, Dutch uh, oven type uh, holder and or pot and I cook it for five to six hours. 
And so everything breaks down. It reduces, it reduces, it reduces. And that's the way our faith is. We must have the ingredients, which is the gospel message. We must have all the right ingredients. We must do. So not just hearing, but we must do. And not just do once. This is not just a one-time thing where I'm baptized or I uh, do this or do that just one time. It's a continual thing. It's a duration. That's why those who um, are persevered till the end will be saved. That's why we work out our salvation with fear and trembling. Um, so we have to continue to persevere in the faith. Uh, final perseverance uh, is, is the key. So get the right ingredients, the hearing of the gospel message and everything that that entails, and then call upon him and then continue to call upon him for that duration of time. Um, so I also uh, recently, my son uh, Maximilian was uh, confirmed and the priest had a great message for him at his confirmation. And it was very simple, very to the point, but it ties in with this ingredients that are necessary. When someone is confirmed, when Maximilian's confirmed, he has the ingredients of the faith, but he has to be the soldier for Christ. He has to be the one that goes into battle, that applies the action, that, that not just hears, but does and continues to do that thing, continues to persevere, continues to be a soldier for Christ. And so the priest said that, uh, told Maximilian to live the theological virtues, faith, hope, and charity, that those virtues need to grow. They had been given to him by baptism. They were strengthened with confirmation, and they need to continue to persevere in those virtues um, and allow those virtues to be perfected. So again, if you think of faith, hope, and charity as the right ingredients, we have to continue to um, ask the Holy Spirit, the fire of the Holy Spirit, to activate those, to, to continue to, um, in a sense, cook those, uh, continue to apply those and do that over and over and over and over again while our Lord perfects us until we reach heaven because nothing imperfect will get to heaven. So we want to reduce that down, reduce that down, just continue to persevere in the faith. And then the priest said, and there's ways that we know um, how to uh, live those virtues. So faith, hope, and charity. How do we have a guide on what that is? Well, faith, our guide for the faith is the 12, the 12 articles of the creed. Um, we have received those articles as part of faith. Is the, we have, those have been revealed to us through Jesus Christ and an apostolic church. And then our response is the other piece to that. Um, hope, we know hope through the Our Father. What do we ask for in the Our Father? We ask for our daily bread. We ask for the graces necessary to get to heaven, the graces necessary to live a good life. We ask for the forgiveness of sins so we have the hope and the forgiveness of sins. We ask to be delivered from evil and uh, led not into temptation. And so this, this hope, an understanding of the hope, is, is really um, kind of centered in praying the Our Father and understanding the Our Father. And then charity, of course, um, we know how to be charitable by the Ten Commandments, how to love God and love our neighbor because of God. And so the Ten Commandments give us that guide. But even with this, faith, hope, and charity, and understanding that through the Creed, the Our Father, and Ten Commandments, we need, we need grace to do that. No one can be perfected in those three virtues and really live out the Creed, the Our Father, and the Ten Commandments without grace. And where do we get that grace most perfectly? That sacramental grace, that habitual grace, it's through the sacraments. And this takes us back to calling upon the Lord. Call upon the Lord in baptism. If you are not baptized, learn about Jesus Christ. Contact your local priest and call upon his name through the sacrament of baptism. If you are baptized but not confirmed, call upon his name and be confirmed so you'll have those many graces and strength to be a soldier for Christ. If you are not able to receive the Eucharist because you're in serious sin, make a good confession. Repent of the sin, make a good confession. Call upon his name in confession. Um, if you are not um, you know, taking advantage of the Eucharist, if you are in the state of grace, receive the Eucharist. Call upon his name in the Eucharist. If you are married and you're not in a valid marriage, get in a valid marriage, a valid sacramental marriage. Do what needs to be done to do that and call upon his name in matrimony. If you're a bishop or a priest, call upon those graces given to you in holy orders. And at the end of your life, at the end of your life, call upon his name through those last rites. And so we have the ability to call upon his name to be doers, not just hearers. 
and this takes us our whole life which is that perseverance uh, continuing to cook and cook and cook simmer simmer and and all those ingredients just work their way together they reduce down to a beautiful beautiful meal that we can of course present to our Lord um, so I hope these analogies help. Um, I've been blessed these last uh, few weeks to hear some of these great analogies from some priests that are in my life. And I'm very happy to, um, that they've been edifying to me and I hope they are to you as well. Uh, thank you for joining me for Lexio on the Go. Please take the time to visit linktoliturgy.com where you'll find fast, free, and faithful resources on the gospel. And please check out our online school link to liturgy.teachable.com. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen.